Hello and welcome to Politics War Room with James Carvel and I'm Al Hunt. Thank you for joining us. This week we're joined by top media mavens, LA Times editor Jackie Combs, author of a new book about the Republicans in the Supreme Court, and Ben Smith, the great media critic of the New York Times. Remember, we take your questions each episode. So write into politicswarroom at gmail.com or send a tweet to at Politicon for next week's show. We'll get to as many as we can, and don't forget to tell us where you're from. Also, please check out the links to our friends and sponsors, HelloFresh and Blinkist, in the show notes. We thank you for supporting these sponsors. It really helps make the podcast happen. Please tell your friends about us and remind them to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcast. Hey, James, New York had a mayor's race uh, this week. We may not know the actual outcome for another two weeks. It ranked voting. It's very complicated, at least to my mind. But I think it's quite clear that the defunding the police candidates were soundly rejected in liberal New York City. Soundly rejected? Overwhelmingly rejected. Eric Adams, of course, the first round of voting, of, you know, I don't know where this ranked voting is going to go, got more votes than Maya Wiley, Scott Stringer, and Diane Morales combined. All right? It, 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 it was they were a, the anti-police. Right. There, it was a profound rejection of left-wing wokeism. It can't be interpreted any other way. And by the way, the, the, the you know, non-white vote was overwhelmingly for Adams. A lot of these overeducated, young, affluent whites who complain about everything actually disrespect the opinions of black people. They disrespected it when they went overwhelmingly for Joe Biden. They disrespected him in, in, in the second congressional district in Louisiana. They disrespected him in Virginia, and they disrespect him in New York. These are some arrogant little twerps that think that they know more than people that actually have to live a life. And it, 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 we showed that in New York. Well, that's a lesson, no doubt. I'll tell you what else it is. Um, it, it, you know, it shows you how unimportant Twitter can be. Andrew Yang was the Twitter champion candidate. I mean, he was all over Twitter. Uh, Eric Adams and, uh, and, and Mez Garcia, the Sanitation uh, Commission uh, chairman, uh, they, they didn't have that much of a presence. That's, you know, people get obsessed with Twitter. I'm sorry, that's not where most of the electorate is. But anyway, it's a, it's a, we'll, we'll come back to you with a final counting in New York whenever it's in a couple of weeks. But I think uh, then it's quite clear that probably Eric Adams uh, is the likely next mayor. We'll see. James, on speaking of voting, Republicans refuse to even allow a vote in the Senate on legislation to overcome voter suppression. But that always was going to be the case. And I think Chuck Schumer and Joe Manchin are now figuring out their next step. I have, I have a criticism, not of, of obviously the Republicans who don't want a lot of people to vote, but it's the media who simply were writing, this bill's dead now. No, it's not dead. It's a process. you got to understand the way the Senate works, the way Schumer and Manchin are working. I'm not sure it'll pass. I think it's got at least a 50-50 chance. But, you know, you, you, you can't be lazy. It's an easy headline. It's dead. The harder headline is, here's the circuitous route to passage. Correct. And, and also, it's the headline that will get more clicks and more people right. will read it if you say, look, we're, you know, halfway through this process. And, you know, so you, you're right. I concur totally. And it's just, just not a, a done deal at all. No, there's a there's a lot more left. And I think Joe Manchin would, having started this, <clears throat> would like to see it, see it to its completion. I'm not quite sure what those specifics would be, but... I'll tell you something else that, that, that may be dead, though, and that's going to be intercollegiate big-time athletics as we have known them. The uh, Supreme Court had the very best lawyer, the NCAA had the very best lawyer in the land, our friend Seth Waxman, and they lost 9-0 to zero on a case. Uh, the number of athletes brought against the NCAA on a narrow issue of whether they could get educational benefits, but I think it's quite clear that that's going to usher in uh, much broader rulings. I don't have any idea where it's going to end up, but I assure you the NCAA and intercollegiate athletes ain't going to be the same. Well, I, you know, I've read, I, I read the stuff in the press and everybody's held in the decision and everybody hates the NCAA. What I have never seen is a credible way for college sports to go forward. And I'm all for it if somebody shows it to me. No one 
And let me repeat this. No one has said, how do they see the future? But they'll have to figure it out because, you know, all of the college football haters have had their day and they're all ecstatic. So you, you tell me how we go from here and I'll go with you. Well, I don't know. But what I will tell you is that when someone complains that the football coach makes 40 times more than the chair, chairman of the history department, the rejoinder is, hey, he brings in a lot more money. That's true. He does. But it's because of those players who play for him. The same with the basketball coach. Okay. And when the, when, the, when the CEO of the NCAA makes $2.7 million, I'm sorry, it's a business. And in uh, most businesses, sorry, that's, that's, most most businesses compensate their employees, and that's 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 well, a simple I, I, reality. I, 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 tell me how compensation works. I, I don't know. I, I, I just I know. Okay, I, I know, but it's easy to say. I, I don't know. Okay. You, well, it's just fucked up. Okay. Good. How? Yeah. Give me give me the alternative. I'm I'm, I'm waiting. Well, what I'll, what I'll tell you is John Thompson, the late Georgetown basketball co coach, said whatever they come up with will be better than what they have well, because okay. what they have on. now is corrupt and rotten. And so it'll something will evolve, but, boy, they brought it on themselves. Well, they really did bring say, it on I, themselves. I, 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 I'm just waiting for the first how does this work. That's all I'm waiting for. I've, I've, never, yeah. I've, got, I've, I've read Sally Jenkins. I've read everybody. I've listened to everybody. And how anything is better than this? Okay, give me anything. I just want to hear anything. It'll that's it'll happen. For. It'll happen because this is so bad. Okay. Uh, so that's, I, that's but, but we don't know. That's, we'll agree. We don't know what the hell is going to happen. We, just we know don't know anything. Okay. Usually, when you change things, you're not quite sure how it's going uh, to. I, 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 I think we're not, we're not quite sure. No I, one has I, the foggiest I, idea. Well, and except that this system is so bad. That's the one thing we know. Okay. And corrupt. So well, I, you know, okay. I've always found college sports to be. Pretty interesting in depth. Oh, I think it's I think it's fun. I think the games are well played. I'm watching this just, college world series. Just, they plan well, their asses off. Well, it just happens I don't think to it's be corrupt. also. Well, John Thompson, I think, knows more than you or me. Well, maybe and, John Thompson uh, does. Says, I don't. But well, you know, John Thompson's guy would you know he's one of six thousand basketball coaches. A good one. But John Thompson, did, no one has an idea what to replace it with. All I'm saying That's is... That's not the okay, issue. Wait. That is emphatically okay. not the issue. Okay. The issue is whether the current system is worth preserving. And I think the answer to that is an emphatic no. And you've got to figure out what the new system is. All right. Then when we yeah. figure it out, let me know. Till then. Yeah, well, I will. I mean, okay. All right. the up. Supreme okay. Court started us on that route. And, uh, and uh, we'll see. Hey, James, we are joined by Ben Smith, the media correspondent for the New York Times. He's provocative. He's edgy. He's the most influential media reporter in America. Ben, another blockbuster this week. We found out from you that a prime source from top Washington journalist is none other than Tucker Carlson, the race baiting, loony, conspiracy peddling top Fox News anchor. Let me ask you just to start with, are there any ethical issues here? There are ethical issues everywhere. What do you mean specifically? Well, about using Tucker Carlson, given everything he does, as a as a as a source, without letting readers know this is the sort of person you're going to. I mean, I think readers use people. I mean, I think reporters have used people who, you know, are disreputable in various ways as sources. Certainly, starting with, you know, a senior FBI official named Mark Felt, who'd been involved in all sorts of wrongdoing, and was the Watergate source. Yeah, I agree. But, you know, I, I've i never, maybe it's generational, I've never used a columnist or commentator or reporter as this would. Robert Novak uh, and I were actually close friends, disagreed in everything, traveled together, had dinner together, did a TV show together. Uh, I think he was a much better reporter than Tucker Carlson. But I wouldn't have thought of calling Bob Novak and said, hey, what are right-wing Senate Republicans up to? I, it just was something you didn't do. Has, has it just changed now? Well, in the Trump years, you know, it was, I mean, there was this line, I think it's Chris Hayes' line, that it was unclear if, if, if Fox News, if we were living, you know, with um, state-run television or a television-run state. And I do think that the way in which Fox and the media in general were just woven into the core of the Trump administration meant that if you weren't treating Tucker Carlson as, you know, an equally serious player in the Trump administration as, say, General Mattis, you were sort of like not seeing how the thing actually worked. 
That's just a new a new level of, uh, of, of, of horrified uh, uh, Trump administration and stuff. Let me ask you this from your from your reporting. You talked to a number of these people. I'm sure you went back and read some of the stories. How good was the information that Carlson was uh, was feeding them? Um, you know, I don't. It's hard to honestly. It is hard to know what came from one source, and 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 I don't. And I would have written that in more detail if I had it. Um, the one sort of really obvious one was about Tucker's mission to save America from COVID, where he in in where where he went to Mar. He talked about having gone to Mar Lago in, and he talked about it on the record. Prior to it being on the record, there were lots of versions of it that were also that were anonymously sourced. Um, you know, I don't know. It was certainly made Tucker look good, but it's, it seems like he actually did, was sort of on the right side of that one. So I don't really know. I mean, I think, but but also, you know, one thing reporter said is he is is that you know he enjoy he enjoyed and always had enjoyed kind of gossiping with reporters and that doesn't necessarily mean you know gossip isn't necessarily not necessarily not necessarily he was saying that something was gospel he was just sort of passing on what he'd heard yeah james so so ben i as i recall a long time ago you were on crossfire with me and ben bradley said i wouldn't know ben smith if he fell on me and you said, my wife said, oh, yeah, you would, because he weighs too much. I'll never forget that. It was really funny. But as, as I recall, you, you said that about me. I, I think it was Bradley, but it doesn't matter. I, I, no, my no, my it memory was you. It was me. Okay, it was me. Let's ask Tucker Carlson. Uh, uh, okay. All right, okay. So I, I, anyway, dude, it was funny, and we did the thing at time. So, <laughs> wow. so I, I know Tucker well. All right. And then he called reporters a bunch of what was it, a bunch of animals i think he yes, he, he, yes. Yeah, right. cringing at cowardly animals or some right. such thing and, yes, and I, I, I also and, and you can comment on this howard stern famously said that trump actually hates his supporters what he really cares about is maggie haberman all right he, he didn't say maggie's name specifically but that was the thing i and I know Tucker well. You've covered him. You've obviously talked to him. I think Tucker would much rather be at a dinner party with Al and Judy, all right, <laughs> in, in the editor oh, of you. the New York Times, than he would be in any way, shape, or form with the people that listen to his television show. Do, do you concur in that evaluation? Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, he obviously cares a lot. Um about Maggie Haberman just cares obsessively about the media, but also obviously enjoyed the adulation of his supporters. So I don't know. I mean, but, but he, you know, he cares a lot about the media, you know, just he, a lot. Like, yeah. It, it, like he, he knows our names, you know, it's, right, it's very right. flattering. And I don't, you know, and I, like I say, we have a friendly relationship. We're kind of not so much now because it's just kind of hard to take, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say we did speeches together. We did television shows together. We've done a lot of stuff, but he's always like enjoyed his kind of role as the kind of provocateur, the different kind of different point of view. And, you know, he's very skilled when he does, you know, high end speeches to J.P. Morgan or something like that. And then what the guy you see on TV is not remote, is not, well, I say remote, but is, is not the same person that I see socially or I see at, at high end corporate events of which admittedly we've both done a bunch of and the guy that talks to you and other journalists on the phone is not the same guy you see on on fox news at at eight o'clock every night at least that's my observation from sitting here you know that i i don't i you know i don't want to like i actually in the sort of strange writing of this column don't want to really talk about any private conversations i might have had with, right. with tucker um I don't know if it's that different, though. I mean, I think that, you know, he presents himself as a sort of estranged child of the elite on TV. And, you know, I think he'll emphasize to that crowd more his opposition to critical race theory and might and might emphasize to you more how much he likes labor unions. But I'm not sure those things are I think there's sort of a spectrum of kind of red brown politics that he's pretty fully embraced and like. 
he can talk, you know, and kind of emphasizes different aspects to different audiences and knows his audience really well and has always been great at knowing his audience, kind of. But I'm not sure they're that, I don't know, I'm not sure it's that that separate or that different. All right, Al? Well, you know, but also, uh, Ben, he has a history of n- not telling the truth sometimes. I mean, on people invading his home and some of the things he said on his show as fact or clearly not fact. Usually you're suspicious of a source that has a history of not telling the truth. Uh, didn't that present a problem to any of these reporters? Oh, I think to differing reporters in differing degrees, for sure. Um, and, and yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that said, you know, we are all people who have spent our careers covering politicians. So people who lie to you on background is not like a totally brand new phenomenon. Right. I, my guess is that, you know, he, he takes it to a higher degree than at least most, but not all for sure. Is there any indication that any news organizations or any reporters might have been softer on some of, I think, the absolutely, you know, despicably outrageous things that Carlson says on television because he dished dirt to them? Um, honestly, I think so. Like, I can't, po- I, mean, I can't point to any story or anyone in particular, but I think if you look broadly at the way Glenn Beck was covered, you know, when he was getting incredible ratings, when he was sort of a dominant American public figure, but was spreading unhinged, sometimes I think anti-Semitic conspiracies about Obama, you know, with those crazy charts with arrows to Soros and this and that. And ultimately, Fox took his show down because it was so inflammatory and so crazy and losing advertisers, even though it got great ratings. And I think that Carlson, who is basically doing exactly the same thing, has had a little bit of protection and insurance from his friends in Washington, just in maybe in what's not being written and what's not being said. And what was the internal reaction at Fox News to uh, to your column? You know, I don't know about the internal reaction. The external reaction seems to have been a long segment on Hannity last night about how terrible I am. <laughs> That's a bad yeah, one. I, I want to ask both of you something, because both of you are... Two of the, I, mean, I don't mean to blow smoke up your ass, but it happens to be true. <laughs> I'll take two, it, of the, I'll take two of the <laughs> most knowledgeable people about journalism and American media and everything. And I was told very early when I came to Washington is talk to reporters, be nice to them, and it, it'll pay off. And I got to tell you, it was a good piece of advice. And people that engage journalists tend to fare better in stories than people that don't. If, 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 am I crazy if I look back on my career and I think that was a valuable piece of advice that if I'd have done everything exactly the same, but I'd say, I'm not going to talk to any of these assholes or yeah, I'll talk to you off the record. I'll shoot the shit with you. I'll go to lunch. You know, I'll give you some, some background anecdotes. I'm just, I'm just going to do better in stories than if I didn't do that. Is that is, do either one of you dissent from that concur or tell me what your view is. Ben. I mean, I think I broadly concur, you know, I mean, there's an old saying, you know, either you feed them hamburger or you are the hamburger um, with reporters. And and as a, in my sort of recent past as a, you know, mid-level media executive, I definitely followed the same rule. Um, And it's not, you know, and it's, it's, I think, I think there are journalists like your old friend, Robert Novak, who would tell people that you were either a source or a target for whom that deal was absolutely explicit and deliberate and others who I think never do that play, play no favorites at all. And it doesn't help matter at all. But I think in the broad sweep of it, absolutely, obviously. Oh, I, I agree totally. I think just, uh, just talking to someone, first of all, they get their point of view across. Second of all, you can understand them a little bit better. Uh, you look at the people who've gotten great, great press in general over the years. It cuts across all kinds of partisan ideological grounds of Jim Baker in the old days of Bob Strauss. Kissinger is a classic example of that. And people who don't talk to the press sometimes unfairly get a bad press. I just think that's human nature. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's always been suspected to be true that with Bob Woodward, you're much better to speak to him than if you don't. Uh, and I, I, and I, and I think, I think it's not. It, there's nothing nefarious about it. It's just, you, you know, I, I wrote in a book one time. Don't meet the people in a green room before you go on TV because you might end up liking them. <laughs> and if you, it's just human nature. If you spend time on the phone with somebody and they ask you about your children or your family or your parents or anything else, 
they're just going to they they're, they're going to be more favorably disposed to you. I know I, I, I it's the same way in my life. I don't I don't, I don't think that that there's a hard line in journalism, but I, I think it's really interesting to talk to two people like both of you who span eons of, of, of career and observations about journalism. I think one young one old, right. right? He's talking about you, Al. I know, I know. Right. From, from, from the from the dark yeah. ages. Well, to ben, I don't know. Really, I don't know how young you are anymore, Ben. <laughs> no, I'm 44. I've got eons. Oh, oh my God, you're, you're a kid. kid. You're, like, you're a kid. Oh, you're in that time, so you know. that time. Hey Ben, yeah. let right, me yeah. ask you a question that I have never asked a reporter unless he or she worked for me. Uh, and that is, from reading your piece, it seems clear, I think you actually almost outrightly said it, that Tucker has been a source for you. Can you add anything to that? No, I don't think I said that in the piece. Other well, than, you other suggested than it. From some, from other, other than from quote and quoting and so from some on-the-record text messages we exchanged. Yeah, but you said you couldn't talk about the off-the-record conversations you had with him. And uh, Yeah, I wouldn't want to talk about I, I actually, I, I, I... I know it's slightly odd as a media reporter who is trying to get reporters at various times to um, to violate their own off-the-record agreements in talking to me about sourcing, but I, I wouldn't do that. Do you use the term off-the-record? You know, I try – I use it casually when it is feels either at all high stakes or confusing. I try to have a conversation with the person I'm talking to about what exactly we're doing. You know, I can quote this but not attribute it to you. I can't use this in any way. I can use the information but not quote you or refer to a conversation. Yeah, I think it's actually – everyone has different ideas about what off the record and background meant. And there's a reporter I know who does this, I think, kind of interesting thing where he'll be talking to somebody and says, okay – and this is off the record, by which I mean I'm going to quote it explicitly and refer to you as a senior official at the EPA, okay? And often people say, okay, yeah, I guess that's what off the record means. I think there's a lot of right. confusion. <laughs> yeah, Norman, in Norman Prostein's book on, the, on Time Magazine, The Plame Case, uh, uh, and uh, the special counsel back then, he basically says we shouldn't use the term off the record uh, unless we don't want something – to appear in any way uh, that we ought to use background. It's a, it's an inside journalism thing, but it's a term we use all the time in conversation, but uh, it's important sometimes with sensitive sources. You know, you know I, I just make an observation. 2011, the New York Times, this actually described me as most quoted pundit in modern American politics in probably 2011. I, I can't tell you the number of conversations that I've had with different journalists. And, you know, I've mm -hmm. never been burned. I've never had an issue. And, mm -hmm. and I don't know if I've ever said, well, this is off the record. This is deep background. Understand where I'm coming from. If, if somebody is interviewing me, I said, look, I will to tell you what the fuck I think. And then mm -hmm. tell me what, how you want to quote me. And if I have an issue with that, I'll modify the quote. And I said, good. Mm -hmm. And I, I always found that's the best way to deal with people, and I've never, and I mean, I, if, if I tell you I've had a thousand conversations, I, I, I wouldn't be exaggerating, mm -hmm. and, and I don't think I've ever had a, a, a real big issue with that. James, and I can I tell you that uh, uh, most most sources uh, are, are, not, are not like you, or at least uh, you're you're in the top echelon of, uh, of, of good sources that doesn't create those kind of problems. Ben, final word. Um, you know, I guess I, 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 my one observation on this is I think that the media has always been a little more intertwined with politics than we like to admit, not in a devious or biased way, just politics is in some ways the media business. And it's, a, and you can get a lot of good political reporting out of essentially covering the media. Well, you do that. And you are, as I said, at the beginning of the program, the best. It's a fascinating piece. <clears throat> and uh, keep at it. And thank you so much for being with us. And thank you. Yeah. yeah thanks for having me on. I think it was great when you went to the Times. I bounced. Some of the stuff you do is remarkable. Keep on plugging, dude, you know? <laughs> well, thank you. Important. You bet. Take care. Hey, James, I want to take a minute to tell you and our listeners about a delicious meal service that's taken over our kitchen this past year. With HelloFresh, you get fresh, pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door. We just got a package, James, and I'll tell you, I can't wait for dinner tonight. It makes home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. 
And thanks to HelloFresh, eating healthier has never been easier with low-cal, carb-smart, vegetarian options every week. HelloFresh offers 50 menu and market items each week, including ready-to-eat salads, sandwiches, and soups. And HelloFresh uses high-quality, fresh ingredients sourced directly from growers and delivered from the farm to your front door in under a week. Contact-free, of course. We got ours, as I said, James, today. The best part is every recipe is designed and tested by professional chefs and nutritional experts to ensure it's delicious and it's simple. Your whole family will love it. The Carvilles are going to just love HelloFresh or have loved HelloFresh, James. Well, I already know about it. I've eaten it, and I can attest to you personally that this stuff is really good. I mean, it, it, it's tasty. I mean, I, you know, you, you think back and you think, well, TV dinners, and this kind of stuff had this kind of hangover from that. This is anything but a TV dinner. This, this is much, much closer to dinner in a fine restaurant than it is a TV dinner. And you're right, it, it's portion control. You know what you're getting. The nutritional information is right there. But the most important thing to a guy like me is it tastes good. And that's, that, that's, that's the most, you know, if you just wanted to, you know, have bad taste in food that's good for you, I guess you could do that. But this, this is good. This is great, not good taste. This is really good taste in food that's really good for you. It is. And unlike TV dinners, it's also very healthy for you. So that's a great combination. Right. Eat well. Go ahead, James. Tucker Carlson's family doesn't get a cut out of this either. No way, nor I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to give them any HelloFresh. Eat well with HelloFresh today. Go to HelloFresh.com slash WarRoom14 and use code WarRoom14 for up to 14 free meals plus shipping. For America's number one meal kit, remember, go to HelloFresh.com slash WarRoom14 and use code WarRoom14 for up to 14 free meals plus free shippings. We also include the link in our show notes. Hey, Jackie Combs, a top reporter for the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and now Los Angeles Times, has a compelling new book, Dissent, How the Republican Party Captured Control of the Supreme Court, and we are so pleased to have her. Uh, James, you know Jackie, don't you? I know Rachel Robinson, Jackie Robinson, knew her, his widow, but uh, Jackie... It's Combs, uh, Jackie I, Combs. I no, I... I, I C-A-L-M-S, well, it's close, you, you just that? missed one. It's All right, guys. Oh, okay. All right, this okay. Is, All right. This, <laughs> this is an insight. There is no one in Washington that I doesn't know, know That's Jackie what Combs, I told her. Okay, she and Rahm Emanuel talks to her so much, I can't even... Every time I'm talking to her, I'm Jackie is. She... she she must have a thousand conversations. God, those today. Tokyo bills are going to be just huge. Hey, Jackie, I'll Democrats have won five of the last eight presidential elections. They've taken the popular vote seven times. They've controlled the Senate a little bit more than Republicans over the last 30 years. Yet two-thirds of the Supreme Court Republicans. Just luck? Uh, hardly. It's uh, thanks to Mitch McConnell and before him Orrin Hatch and just a general willingness, I think uh, Republicans would agree to play dirtier than Democrats do. Their Democrats have what people call a responsibility gene. They like to play by the rules. They like to have government work. And and uh, you never would have seen Democrats uh, pre- prevent a president in his last year in office from filling the seat that became vacant in February of that year. And get away with it. I mean, their their own people would be saying, we can't do this. But that's exactly what Mitch McConnell did to Barack Obama to prevent Merrick Garland in 2016, which is why we have Neil Gorsuch on the court today, one of its most, very most conservative. Well, members. Jackie, let me pick up on that. And you get in this in the book. Republicans kept insisting uh, that year that, that history is, 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 is very clear on this, that when the party uh, controls the Senate, they never confirm a nominee from the president of the other party. People like Mitch McConnell and uh, John Barrasso repeated that time and time again. It's a lie. It's an outright lie. In 1988, Anthony Kennedy was confirmed by a Democratic Senate. He was appointed by Ronald Reagan. They set new rules, and then they lie about it. And, and they tried to 
say that, well, um, Anthony Kennedy wasn't nominated in 19, he was nominated in uh, 1987. Late 87. And it was, it just makes no sense. And uh, the, the fact of the matter is that Democrats approved a Republican appointed Supreme Court justice in a presidential election year that they actually, you know, the results in 1988 notwithstanding, there was a point quite late into the year when Democrats actually thought they would win the White House that year. You know, talk about the Federalist Society, which is prominent uh, in your book. The Republicans, uh, they call the shots for Republican nom you know, nominations, whereas Democrats, and this goes to your earlier point, they even before a nomination comes up, who's going to replace Stephen Breyer? They're arguing back and forth. Should it be a liberal or should it be an ultra-liberal? It really goes, I mean, Republicans have been far more disciplined, ruthless, and often unethical on these court appointments. Well, absolutely. I mean, the, the Federalist Society is just an amazing organization. It's now, it will be 40 years old next year. It is wildly successful beyond even the dreams of those who formed it. And, you know, it was born at the beginning of the Reagan administration. It was just perfect for those times. And, um, and it became quickly a network for essentially identifying, vetting, and vouching for the conservative bona fides of very conservative lawyers to be judicial candidates. And um, so it, they sort of kept it secret, on the more secretive for years. But by the Bush administration, George W. Bush, it was just open. Um, all six members of the Supreme Court who are Republican appointees were, were or are members of the Federalist Society. And, you know, it's not sort of a uh, nefarious organization at all. It's, you know, there's dark money behind it. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's just a network of like-minded people and, and, uh, increasingly it's, um, increasingly conservative, just like the party itself. And by, uh, Bush's time and certainly Trump's, it was just out in the open, you know, Trump's ramper. I think it's probably, I'd be interested in what you two think that list he put out, Trump, in 2016, listing exactly who he would name as Supreme Court justices, is what got him elected because he, this, you know, three times divorced Manhattanite, had to convince the religious right that he was one of them and wouldn't name his sister to the Supreme Court, who was pro-choice. Yeah. Uh, ja among yeah. James Carville? Yes. So, 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 Jackie, I, I have a theory. And I have been talking me out of it, but it's going to be difficult. That the most significant event in all of this was Bush v. Gore. Because they just said, fuck it, we're going to steal the election. And you know what the elites in the commentary is going to do? They're going to praise Al Gore for accepting it. And once they said, we right out in public just came up and stole and stopped the vote count and stole an election. And the Democrats didn't do shit about it. They didn't give a crap from their own to this day. And the reason that McConnell says we're just not going to vote on this is because we let them get away with Bush v. Gore. So I remain convinced to this day. And I'd like for somebody to go dig up all of the commentary that people said, well, they decided we're a nation of laws. That's it. They stole the son of a bitch. They got away with it. And we acquiesced and just licked our wounds and went home. Do you disagree with that in any way? I don't disagree. I, and a lot of Democrats would agree with you. It was Bush v. Gore was the impetus for Democrats to attempt, Democrats in the legal community, to attempt to form an organization that was just, they hoped, just like the Federalist Society. It was called the American Constitution Society. But Democrats being Democrats, they never could achieve the success of the Federalist Society. They didn't have the money or the commitment to do it. You know, Republicans are just simply care about the courts more than your party does. And so you explain to me, James, why Democratic voters don't see the importance of voting for courts at election time. 
Well, well, I, again, they might feel more differently, but the one thing that they knew, that they could get away with it, and we would let them get away with it. Right. If 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 that, if that would have been the, if that ruling would have gone, it, you know, assume a different outcome, and it have said we're going to stop the vote count and name Al Gore president, we would still. The reason is is that our party and the people that cover American politics, frankly, just want to get put everything behind you, take it off the table, don't talk about it. The Supreme Court has ruled. You know, Bush is going to be different than Clinton. I heard all that shit, okay? I was there. And, and please don't anybody tell me I didn't hear that shit, because I did. And he was a compassionate conservative, and he was better, and he wasn't going to get any blowjobs in the White House. And nah, 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 nah. You know, of course, we got wars. We got the, you know, repeal of the assault weapons ban. We got, you know, recessions, depressions. We got Katrina. We got all of that shit. And it all goes back to Bush v. Gore and the lame-ass response of the Democrats and the whole kind of media infrastructure. And I'm pissed off about it, and I'm going to die pissed Jackie off Jackie comes. It. That's, that's, <laughs> that's my view. All right. And I don't think you disagree with me, Jackie. I really don't. No, and it was a 5-4 to four decision. It was the biggest 5-4 to four decision to, of its time, and we've seen a lot of them since, but nothing on that scale or a bad to steal a presidential election to stop a vote count no it wasn't a 5-4 decision to do what, what they're trying to dismantle labor unions you see this decision today where you, the, the, the unions can't even go on property to try to organize they don't give a shit about gay bakers they don't give a shit about all of these things where everybody goes oh look at this man you know or the NCAA they care about one thing Corporate power. Okay. Jackie, and until James, we understand that, we'll never know. Okay, go ahead, Jackie. I'm sorry. <laughs> She's our guest. <laughs> the, the, uh, you know, in Bush v. Gore, later Sandra Day O'Connor would express, you know, regrets for her vote. And um, the, the decision is so, it's a measure of how bad it was, perhaps, that it has not been cited once as a precedent. Uh, for any reason, in in a case that's arisen since 2000, December of uh, 2000. But until Brett Kavanaugh, there was a case last year, an election-related case, in which Brett Kavanaugh is believed to have written the opinion, and he cited Bush v. Gore in a footnote, which got tons of attention and criticism because nobody thought Bush v. Gore was worth citing as a precedent for anything. It was. It's it almost as if you know they, uh, they they want to bury it. They're so ashamed of it. But it took you know it took Trump's nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, to revive it, if only in a footnote. So, Jackie, when you go and you look at you, you, you studied this, and I'll be honest, I haven't had an opportunity to read your book, but I want to read it. How critical was the whole Tea Party movement and, and this whole evolution of where we are now? I think it's it's central to it. I think, you know, because I, can, I, I refer to like four revolutions or movements that have pushed the party over the last 40 years increasingly ever more to the right until it's like off the deep end. So you had the Reagan revolution, which give, gave way to Newt Gingrich revolution in the 90s. And it was Gingrich's revolution with its emphasis on, as he put it, be nasty. And his alliance with the conservative media that was coming on uh, increasingly expanding and aligning with the Republican Party in the wake of the fairness doctrine being done and the Fox News being created and talk radio exploding all over the country. So you had this marriage of Newt Gingrich's Republican Party and conservative media, which radicalized this voter base that by the time of the Tea Party in the in the, the gate took took root in the end of George Bush George W. Bush's administration, it was a bottom up phenomenon. It's like Newt had created a monster. The Republican leadership had created this monster that, that started telling them what to do. And it was this base that called the shots, 
that caused Republican leaders to be ousted. And it was that base that Trump came along and harnessed in 2015 and spoke to them, licensed them in all their most bigoted and uh, far right opinions, xenophobic. And from the time he went down that es escalator, the golden escalator at the Trump Tower in June of 2015 and talked about Mexican rapists coming into the country, he spoke to the, so many of those people. And, and so the MAGA army is really the Tea Party evolved. And now with Trump or without Trump, they will go on and they will continue to call the shots for the Republican Party. Do you disagree? So no, I don't. And 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 I'm going to turn it back over to Al. But but I, I I totally agree. And I actually have this theory. And you're coming. Is is that it, I don't I don't think he will. But if Trump runs in 2024, he will be a moderating effect on MAGA, because if they let you know DeSantis and Josh Howley and whoever else, they will they will go even more nuts, and Trump will go. I mean, they're just going to keep, you know, one up in each other till I, I don't know where we go. I mean, refer to story in Florida where they're spying on college campuses now. I, 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 I think I, I, I so agree with you. Uh, I, I, and I don't see how to get off this hamster wheel. Do you? Well, when you say that Trumpism would be the moderating influence in 2024 if he got elected, you're just, that's relatively speaking, right? Yeah, rel yeah relative to, to, to Howley or Ted Cruz or, or DeSantis. Because they'll all, if Trump doesn't run, they're going to all try to out-Trump Trump. Absolutely, I agree with that. Okay, they're, they're just going to be, how, how crazy can I get? We're going to have, we, let's have guns and coffins. Hey, you can't get buried yeah. without a Jackie, gun. Jackie, let's talk about the central figure in your book, Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, he is a man of personal charm, of intellectual talent, but you document that he also has a history of not telling the truth. Yeah, um, it is. It's a it's a through line all the way through from high school on. I mean, uh, in in things large and small, and some of what I might might trace here might seem small, but if as many of his um, acquaintances of the time said to me. If he'll lie about the small stuff, why should we believe him on the big stuff? The big stuff being things like sexual assault allegations. Um, so, you know, he, he's testified, and all of these things I'm going to say, he's testified to under oath, um, that he was always, that he was legal drinking age in high school. He never was. And, you know, you tell me, we've all been high school seniors. I knew darn well when I became legal. And... Uh, and so he's he he never was legal until um, uh, college because Maryland had changed his drinking law. Okay, small that's relatively small. Then you take it through the uh, assaults in high school. That was that's a whole other question. That's the he said she said question. But what I try to show in the book is that there's all these things that he has done through the years when he was already. Uh, a lawyer and in responsible positions. And the one that I dwell on, I, I go into detail in because I think it's very damning, is that he was um, in the West Wing in the for George W. Bush as a uh, top legal advisor to George W. Bush from during the period 2001 to 2003. And one of his primary responsibilities was pushing through Bush's judicial nominees. Well, at the same time, there was this senior Republican staffer on the Hill in the Senate who got access to Demo Senate Democrats' emails and ultimately, over a two-year period, stole nearly 5,000 of them, had access. Nobody knew he had them, but the Democrats couldn't figure out how do they know what we're doing. And, and the single biggest recipient of those emails about Democrat strategy was Brett Kavanaugh in the White House. And yet when this scandal of these stolen emails came to light and the Senate investigated, the Bush White House wouldn't um, cooperate. Uh, it also wouldn't cooperate with a subsequent investigation at the Southern District of New York. So Kavanaugh was never called to account. And it wasn't until his Supreme Court nomination in 2018 that among the very few emails that the Republicans allowed to be um, that give Democrats access to, there's damning evidence of just how many of these emails 
uh, Kavanaugh received. And he had said for years under oath in his previous confirmation hearings in 2004 and 2006 that he had no idea, no reason to suspect that this guy, Manny Miranda, the Senate aide, had had gotten pilfered emails. But by 2018, when it was clear, I mean, the emails were right in front of everybody to read, Kavanaugh changed his story and he said, well, that's just, you know, the fact that Man, that Miranda knew those things, that's just because he would talk to people on the Hill and Republicans and Democratic staff talk to each other all the time. That's the, just the way things work. I mean, g- give me a break. If you looked at those emails, one of the emails included a 4,000-word memo from Democratic Senator Pat Leahy's general counsel to him about strategy. Now, how in the heck does Manny Miranda get a 4,000-word memo to Pat Leahy. I've never, I covered Congress full-time for 13 years. I guarantee you no Democratic staffer ever gave a Republican staffer a 4,000-word memo. So, so Jackie, boss. he hasn't told the truth a lot. Let's go to his character, too. Two, two episodes that you mentioned in the book. Number one, when he was a Ken Starr investigator, how he treated uh, the late Vince Foster's teenage daughter, and secondly, he did go when he was up for a judicial nomination to the much-respected David Kendall, who was Clinton's lawyer, to seek his endorsement. Tell us about those two episodes. Well, uh, Ken Starr had been a, pro- a mentor of, of, of uh, Brett Kavanaugh and brought him into this uh, investigation of Clinton, telling him it would be short you know, a matter of months. And, and uh, Kavanaugh spent, ultimately spent about four years there. And his primary assignment was to um, investigate whether Clinton's top aide and childhood friend, Vince Foster, had indeed committed suicide as about five different entities had concluded, including the FBI, or was it murder, as the right wing was claiming, because they were alleging that Vince Foster had been murdered by the Clintons somehow because he had dirt on them. Um, Kavanaugh spent uh, three years and $2 million on this, even though by his, the first year into it, memos show that he had concluded that it was suicide, but the right wing kept pushing and he kept giving, he kept trying to just keep investigating. And in the course of that, he uh, called for subpoenas from the Foster family, which had been, of course, uh, mourning their father since he died in mid-1993. So by 1995, he went so far as to get a hair sample from Vince Foster's teenage daughter so that he could compare it to strands of hair that were on Vince Foster's clothes when he died. I mean, that's just, that's a teenage, I mean, I, I, I can't, tell, God, tell us the David Kendall story. And so, so David Kendall, of course, was the Clinton's uh, chief lawyer, and he had known Kavanaugh as a young man. Kavanaugh had been a uh, uh, a so law as a law student had been an associate in the same firm Kendall works in. So um, there came a point where, you know, it, they started out somewhat friendly, but it got very antagonistic and hostile. But uh, by 2003, when, as I said, Bush nominated uh, Kavanaugh to be on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, the second highest court in the nation. Uh, Kavanaugh knew at that point that a colleague of his on the Star Committee, John Bates, who'd been nominated to be a federal judge two years before, had gone to Kendall and asked him if he was going, if he would be talking. negatively about John Bates to Democratic senators because right. the fear was in a right. very narrow, narrowly divided Senate that if you, you know, sort of, uh, right. that people implicated in the Starr investigation would not get, con- might not so get So bring us back to, bring us back to, 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 to Kavanaugh. 
Ke well, Kendall uh, went ahead and vouched for Bates, and so Kavanaugh knew this, and he, two years later, he, he decides to call Kendall and asks him, you know, David, you know, what would your position be to the Democratic senators on my nomination? And, and uh, Kendall says that he told him, you know, no, I think highly of you, but I got two questions. And this is, you know, years later. He says, first of all, were you responsible for all the pornographic excess in the Star Report against Clinton? And second, were you involved in the leaks to the grand jury about what was being investigated? And as Kendall told me in 2019, uh, Kavanaugh's response was sort of like a hum, 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 hum. Said, you know, good to talk to you and thanks very much and hung up. And needless to say, he did not get Kendall's. Um, so that 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 answers those questions. <laughs> it's quite clear. Let me ask you finally, before I turn it back to James, from your prodigious reporting, do you have any doubt that Christine Blasey Ford was assaulted by Brett Kavanaugh when they were teenagers? No, I mean, she has nothing to she had nothing to gain. She had took, it was a great pain. I document at length of how torn she was about coming forward. And there's all these sworn statements about people that she had told over the years, you know, in multiple years. But let me go farther and just say, I not only have it, no doubts about her uh, truth, but more, even more about Debbie Ramirez, the woman at the, at Yale in his freshman year, who was um, alleged that he, uh, exposed himself to her, and she touched his penis. Um, well, um, James? Well, well uh, Jackie, I, I know David Kendall very well. And your story uh, comports with everything that I know about David and what he thinks. So, stealing a Rolex is against the law, right? Stealing an email is against the law, right? So, so... If, if I walk down the street and a guy says, I got this Rolex, I'm going to sell it to you for $50. And I look at it and I know watches and I determine it's genuine and I give him $50. All right? I have committed a crime. If, if I say, well, I, I, know, I don't know where you got it from. You know, maybe it just fell off the turnip chart. No, that, that's sufficient to convict me of trafficking in stolen goods. No one is going to sell you a $50 Rolex. And so is what Kavanaugh arguing that he didn't know all of this stuff was stolen? So this guy proudly touts the fact that he went to Yale and he went to Yale Law School. You know, he has some, you know, sterling IQ. Is that really a credible defense? No. And, you know, it shouldn't have been to the uh, senators who were working to confirm him. I, you know, there are laws against it, but even if it weren't criminal, even if you couldn't prove it in a court of law, it's unethical. There are, there is language in the ABA's code of, uh, uh, pers of, of judicial conduct. And this, and, and at the time of these stolen emails where he was, uh, I think, lying under oath about his knowledge of the theft, the hacking. He he was an appointee at that time, or a nominee to the second highest court in the land. So someone who was going to have a life tenure on the second highest court of the land, which is which has been and was for him a springboard to the Supreme Court, was not investigated and never volunteered to help on this investigation. And then when questioned about it in his subsequent confirmation hearings pled ignorance when only the most stupid person wouldn't have figured out that those were that was pilfered information. So uh, I'll turn it over to Al. I have one more question. You, you followed this closely. You, you've written about it. You know a lot about this. There's become this default position that when we appoint people to the Supreme Court, or even courts of appeals, that we want judges. And, and I would submit to you that why does a career in, in the federal judiciary make you any more qualified to be a Supreme Court justice than being a governor like Earl Warren was? Or, 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 or any number of outstanding jurists that were not trained in the arcania of the law. I, I think this is, a, this is a, a rabbit hole we went down 
that everybody went along with that I, I, I seriously question the, the wisdom of it. Do, do you have any views on that? So you think you think it shouldn't even have to be a lawyer to be on the Supreme Court? Well, I think it's probably beneficial that you have a lawyer, but you could have a governor, you could have a senator, you could have a mayor, you could, yeah, look at Earl Warren. I mean, prime example was governor, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I just don't think that the only people, I mean, you can you cannot be a priest, you cannot be a Catholic and be the Pope, okay? You don't have to be a member of the House to be the Speaker. I, I, I don't want to get into that arcane shit. But I, 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 I just question the wisdom of having nine judges with judicial experience that that's a good idea to be on the Supreme Court. That, that you know, maybe a, a really sharp lawyer that, that you know, was, was a kind of housewife and a lawyer at the same time. Maybe that person would be a good, a good Supreme Court justice. So Jackie Combs, somebody, I don't know if you're a lawyer, but it, it probably helps to be a lawyer. But I'm not. Jackie, gonna... Jackie, give us a short answer. Well, I know Jane from what I walk with you guys a lot. You don't know that, but I listen to you while I walk. So I just found out, I learned recently that James has a law degree. So James could be a nominee for the Supreme wow. Court. Wow. I'll vote, I'll, I'll vote yeah. for that. I'll tell you what else I'll vote for. And that is everybody out there ought to read Dissent. How Republicans Took Over the Supreme Court by Jackie Combs. It is just fabulous reporting in there, as she has always done ever since I have known her for more than 30 years. So thank you so much for being with us, Jackie. No, thank you, Jackie. And, I, and not only do I know who you are, but everybody that counts in Washington knows exactly who you are. And what a great, what a, what a great book. I can't wait to read it. And what a great career you've had and what a great career you have in front of you. Well, James, it's a pleasure to hear, and I'm I'm just touched to hear that from you. And of course, my mentor oh, yeah. Al Hunt. It's great to see you both, and um, I'll listen to you on my walk tonight. But I won't listen to me because I hate. I'll talk my to voice. you later, mentee. <laughs> All right. Hey, James, have you ever had one of those ideas that you just don't know how to get started on making it into a reality? Don't waste time waiting to learn what's important. Get to it. It's why we use Blinkist. Blinkist takes top nonfiction books, pulls out the key takeaway, and gives you text and audio explainers called Blinks that you can learn from in just 15 minutes. You can use Blinks to tackle procrastination. It's a problem some of us have sometimes. Get started on developing an idea or a business. Take your projects to the next level or dive into history with titles like A Short History of Brexit. We'll need that, James. And what really happened? They've blinked thousands of titles in 27 categories. And if you like podcasts, they've blinked those too with Shortcast. And it's all in one app and right in your pocket so you can learn anytime, anywhere with Blinkist. You are a disciple, James. I, I am. And, and the thing I like to know is we need to look at this. Who does that? Is that some, do they hire people to read it and distill it that effectively? And, you know, even stuff that I know about when I read it, it it's highly accurate. Do they this from an algorithm? I, I'd be curious to find out how they do it because what, however they do it, it's really very good at distilling things that, that people who, who are busy and want to know a lot of different things. I couldn't recommend this thing high enough. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Some of their summer... Features, James, you know, include mention Fire and Fury by Michael Wolf and The Soul of America by John Meacham. Uh, go to Blinkist because it has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash War Room to start your free seven-day trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash War Room to get 25% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash War Room, or look for the link in our show notes. All right, James, now for those terrific questions and sometimes good answers uh, segment. Dave in Spokane, Washington says, Defeatist! Quit saying we'll lose the Senate and House in 2022, Democrats. You don't know that. The landscape has forever changed. The GOP is imploding, and we need to help that along. Read Al Hunt's column. 
I, no, I, but he's, I, literally, he's right. I just got it before the thing. You, 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 you address it, some would defer to you because you obviously wrote a column on this. Well, because yeah, you've talked about it a lot, too. Look, first of all, elections are a year and a half away. A lot can happen. Secondly, you pass that Voting Rights Act uh, bill, the Mansion Substitute. You have a robust economy. And if the Democrats are smart enough, as James has emphasized time and time again, to stay on the issues that they won with in 2018, the economy and health care, affordable housing, and not get caught up in this woke crap, I think they have a real shot, certainly to increase their margin in the Senate and maybe to hold on to the House. I, I could agree with you more. In, in the evidence we have so far, in New Mexico special, where the candidate ran a, a vigorous anti-crime campaign, did better than Biden did in a congressional district in New Mexico. If you look at the turnout in the Democratic primaries in Virginia, it was very, very high, al almost the same level as 2017. And it was so anxious to write the Democratic opiate, the Washington Post ran an early headline about low turnout in Virginia. It turned out they had to correct it because they wanted to pounce on it. And if you look at what happened in New York, Democrats are very focused on these issues that improve people's lives. And I think that's a, nothing but a good sign. No, uh, I agree. Um, our next question comes from Jill in Santa Barbara, California. God, do I love Santa Barbara. Ooh, she man. says, I'm wondering what grade you would give Merrick Garland in his first few months. You know, I actually think Merrick Garland is going to be a terrific attorney general. He's made some great appointments. He said he's going to get very involved in this voting suppression, and whatever the Justice Department can do. There's a couple things that I'm a little bit bothered by. Uh, I think they have been reluctant. Uh, to get involved in old Trump cases, they, uh, they 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 cited against a judge who wanted to have, who who demanded that former Attorney General Bill Barr's um, uh, memo justifying the the inexcusable uh, decision not to even pursue Trump's uh, <clears throat> Trump's uh, uh, crimes. I think during the uh, during the impeachment is obstruction of justice. Uh, and, and I want him to tell us who did these, who went and sought phone information from Adam Schiff and, other, and their family and other members of Congress. Because all the former AGs said, we didn't do it, so who did it? Those, are, those, I think, are criticisms he will eventually answer. I think he's going to be a good attorney general. Well, okay, so I, 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 don't, I don't know, maybe I met him, but uh, General Garland, by every estimation, is a fine, brilliant man. But I, this is what I worry about. You know, and things like, he's an institutionalist. He loves the Justice Department. The hell with the Justice Department. You love the rule of law, all right? And if there's a conflict between the institutional interests of the United States Department of Justice and the law, you have to pick the law. And I, I, I just have this, I, I, I hope I'm wrong. People say so. I think he has this sort of turn the page mentality that we can't go back and look at these crimes that were committed. We, we, we have to put the Justice Department on a new path. I hope he doesn't do that. And I, his obligation as Attorney General is not to the Department of Justice, is to the laws is passed that exist in the United States. And there is sufficient reason to believe that multiple numbers of these laws were broken. And you have to go find out. And if it embarrasses the Justice Department, I really don't give a shit. Yeah. <clears throat> well, James, I, you know, I agree. I think he'll get there on most. And there's no case, I think, not to see that bar memo uh, that says that there's no case against uh, Trump for uh, uh, in the uh, in the in the Ukraine case for uh, obstructing right. justice. And, and clearly we ought to know who right. authorized, you know, phone getting phone records from Apple from a member of Congress and his family. That's a simple question to answer. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, I, and I'll tell you, I've been very supportive of President Biden. I, I like him. I, you know, I worry that, that he and Garland are, are too anxious to move on and to let bygones be bygones and broken laws be broken laws. Unless, you know, yeah. I don't think they want to break any laws, but this worries me and it, it, it should concern people that, that listen to the show. Well, we'll keep it's a matter of concern. We'll, we'll, we'll keep focusing on that, James. That's a good point. Kendall in Denver, Colorado, says she loves the show, uh, which is terrific. 
Uh, but she says, this year there was going to be a lot of talk about Susan Collins and Murkowski and Romney and Portman and even Capito as moderates. Now I hear, you know, nary a word. Where in the heck did they go and what or who are they following? Why are they just following Moscow Mitch? Well, the simple reason is they're not going to vote for voting rights, although it's clearly in Article 1, Section 4, that the, the founding fathers, the, the strict constitutional constructionists, this is a, a, a power that is specifically granted to the Congress, because everybody finds it. Mitt Romney, or Susan Collins, she's really, you know, and Lisa Mikowski, Trump doesn't like her. They're not going to do anything that jeopardizes their power. And all they really give a shit about is having 51 Republican senators. They don't care. They don't, they don't give a crap about the Constitution. Because there's a specific grant of power. You just got to go read it. And if you go to this mumbo-jumbo state, Mitt Romney's going to states' rights. Mitt Romney wants to be chairman of the committee. That's all he cares about. And, 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 of course, we always say, oh, well, my God, look, I mean, Susan Collins is a you know, great person of integrity, or, you know, or, or Rob Portman, or, you know what I mean? Or, you know, I, they are never going to do a single thing that jeopardizes them getting back in power. I believe me. And anybody that thinks that is just not thinking. Unfortunately, I agree with you, James. Absolutely, 100%. Jen in Hollywood, Florida says, you guys can probably enlighten us regarding paying for Secret Service expenses after a president's term of service. Is Trump charging fat rates that go directly to him any way of stopping him? By law, uh, ex-presidents are entitled to Secret Service protection for the rest of their lives. The only ex-president who ever turned it down in modern times was Richard Nixon. But what Trump did, two things that are, really are, uh, as Jen writes, an outrage. Number one, he gave Secret Service protection for six months to his family and to Mark Meadows, his former chief of staff. Now, why the hell should Mark Meadows... Uh, be given Secret Service protection. Should you and I pick up the tab for that? The other thing that Trump does is he has the agents stay at his Mar-a-Lago and his Bedminster, New Jersey uh, uh, country clubs, uh, and he charges excess rates. So guess what? Je guess what, James, it's come shock to you. It's going to come as a real shock. Donald Trump is still ripping off taxpayers. So I have very definitive feelings about this. First of all, of course not. The, the worst headline that I could imagine is some left winger shoots Donald Trump. Okay, that would be hard. So if, if this costs us, if, if he's fleecing the taxpayers, or you know, like his son-in-law and his daughter wouldn't let Secret Service agents go to the bathroom in the house. I mean, okay, I, I I could go on and on about all of this, but for God's sakes, whatever it is, protect this guy. Let him die in his, you know, by natural causes, please. And, and if I'm Biden, I would tell the head of the Secret Service, I don't give a shit what it costs. You protect this guy to no end, because if something happens, you can imagine the, what's going to happen in this country. So I'm, I'm like, for God, for God's sakes, protect this guy. And if we got to spend a little more than we should, I'm, I'm, I'm actually kind of for it. I agree, James, but you're not for Mark Meadows having Secret Service no, protection. I'm not, I don't care. I mean, I, look, I, I don't want to get shot, and I don't want Mark Meadows to get shot, but I right, don't right, need Secret Service right. protection. Get his, get his own protection. Yeah, I, I, it, that, that, that's fine. But what I really don't want is for Trump to get shot. I really right. don't want that. Right. But right. And I wouldn't want anybody to get shot, but particularly him, because I know what the outcome would be. So protect his ass good. Leave Mark Meadows to his own. Let him get his own security. Right. James, you're going to like this one. This is from Andrew in New York City, who was originally from Wayne, Pennsylvania. Oh, and he okay. says, you may remember me from, this is to you, from the 86 and 90 Bob Casey gubernatorial campaigns. I was an advanced man in 86 and did some opposition research. You once asked me to chaperone your lovely mother, Miss Niffy, on a tour of my hometown. It was a wonderful early fall afternoon that I remembered vividly in 1990. You tasked me with shadowing the Barbara Haffer campaign and netted her disastrous redneck Irishman comments. Those were the heady times. You also kindly mentioned me in the 2002 Buck Up, Suck Up book with Paul Bagala. So Andrew in New York City has not forgotten his old Carvillian ties. There's nothing that I like better than hearing from people that worked on campaigns with me. 
And Andrew, I, I, I'm so glad that I mentioned you, and I, I believe you, if I had you show my mother around, you were a good staff, but that, that assignment didn't go to anybody that just fell off the turnip truck, I promise you. So I, I'm so glad to hear from you, and uh, I'm so glad you're doing great. And that was one of, that was one of the fun campaigns of, of my entire life. Boy, and uh, that really, that 86 campaign, James, as much as anything launched you, launched you yeah, and Paul. Yeah, God, we, yeah. I, I, you know, I think if we, that, that thing would have gone the other way, my life would have been in, entirely different. Now, it was Paul and I, Mike Donlan was our poster. Uh, I mean, it was, uh, you know, Bob Trump and, you know, Dope did the media. It, it was just a, it was a really, really fun campaign. It, it, they're all fun when you win. When you lose, they all fun. <laughs> yeah. Here's one, actually, that goes to me. It's Donnie in Columbus, Georgia, who said he's been following me since my appearances on Washington Week in Review. God, that was so <laughs> long ago, James. That was... I don't know. Was that, that was, after, was that before the, the Capitol game? Oh, yeah. This was back in the, back in 76 to 83. Oh, I mean, God, that, God, that was before me. Ben Smith was born. Uh, but, and, and he said, I always depended on your insights. He said, and he said, um, and this is to you though, Jim, he said, he saw you jogging on the Columbus river walk, but he didn't bother you to say a lot. I'm glad it was, he saw you jogging because whenever I jog, my old colleague, um, Hans Nichols used to call it the bureau chief shuffle. So I'm sure that your jogging was much more impressive than mine. But his question is, he wants to find out whether we'll ever know what Trump and Putin talked about from their interpreter when they met one on one, I think Trump had the notes destroyed, didn't he? I think he did, he, and he, they kicked everybody out of the room. But I want to talk about Columbus a little bit because I was born maybe 15 miles from Columbus, Fort Benning, in in a town wow. called Casita, Georgia. So, and my dear friend Calvin Smyre, who's a longtime member of the Georgia Legislature, who, who's from Columbus and is still in a, the Georgia Legislature, been a friend of mine since. 1990, and he's just a great guy, and Aflac people have been down at us when you saw me, I was speaking to them, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I got a, a real, real warm spot in my heart for Columbus, Georgia, I really do. Well, that's terrific, and uh, Donnie, I want you to write us and tell us, uh, describe James's jogging style, because I'm sure <laughs> it's a heck of a lot better than mine. I remember, uh, I remember jogging on that river, it's, like, it's, it's very nice, where they've well, done a good job in Columbus. Okay, uh, keep those cards and letters coming in, and also, please keep your nominations coming in for the Ivy League Sphincter Hall of Fame. We've gotten some great ideas, and sometime in the middle of next month, we're going to have the Hall of Fame uh, Ivy League Sphincter. Old -timers, right? uh, the old-timers game. James, I think, I think we ought to say that they, that they have to be dead. You know, I think I think we're okay. looking for people who right. yeah. who've left us. There are going to be lots of candidates. Right, as Yogi Berra said, he is dead at the present time. Right, exactly. And Good. I, just, I, I, I want to tease it, but I think Calhoun's going to get in. <laughs> no, no, I know. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to get out there too far with it. We'll, we'll 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 give it some prayerful consideration as we go forward. And by the way, if any of our listeners have some ideas, for God's sake, let us know because okay. James, we're going to do the outrage of the week. Usually both of us do it, but you tell me you have such a great outrage. I'm going to yield this all to you. This is not my outrage of the week. This is the outrage of the century. All right. If you go to the Tampa Bay Tribune, you will see a story where the Florida legislature and Ron DeSantis signs a bill to spy on the students and faculty of public universities in Florida. Now, let me just tell you how big public universities are in Florida. Of the eight largest public universities in the United States, the first, University of Central Florida, the fourth, Florida Atlantic University, I think it is, five, University of Florida, which is an excellent school, an AAU school, and eight, University of South Florida. They have some of the largest public universities in the United States, and they want to delve into the political opinions of students and faculty. This is an outrage like I cannot believe that this is actually passed a state legislature and a governor to spy on tenured faculty and students' political views. I, 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 I really, and, and if the Democrats don't have enough sense 
to put this front and center, I don't know what to think. I don't know what to think. And I, I read the story three different times. And that's exactly what they're doing. They are want to spy and ask opinions of students that go to Florida public universities and faculties that teach there. What is their political opinion? I, 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 it, it's just stunning to me. You know, you have a long history in higher ed. You're on the board of Wake Forest, a, a highly prestigious public university. You teach at the University of Pennsylvania, an Ivy League school. I've taught at the community college level. I've taught at Tulane, which is a high-end pub, private university. I spent four years at LSU. I, 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 I can't believe this is actually going on. Yeah, I James, can't if, believe that people are outraged. James, if they're looking for a model, there's a, there, there are places to look. They can go to Russia. They can go to China. They can go to North Korea because I suspect they do the same things. And that's what this yeah. is. It, it, it's, it's just, I can't tell you how staggeringly outrageous it is that the Florida governor and the Florida legislature want to know the political opinions of my students and their teachers. I, it's just beyond outrage. And I can't, you know, and I hope that there is a, a significant and strong reaction to this. Yeah, I do too. There ought to be. Everybody uh, out there, if you haven't read about it, uh, James is enlightened you right. now. Read about it now. And, and I, I, I read it three times to make sure. I, 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 it was so outrageous that this can't be true. I think it is true. Hey, thanks for listening to Politics War Room with James Carville. I'm Al Hunt. Don't forget to send your questions for us by email to politicswarroom at gmail.com or tweet them for next week's show at Politicon. Following this episode, we really would appreciate it if you check out the links to our sponsors, HelloFresh and Blinkist. That's HelloFresh and Blinkist. We deeply thank you for supporting them. When you do, it helps make this podcast happen. To keep up with us, subscribe to Politics War Room on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. Please rate the show with a five-star review. We'll be back next week with another show as we continue our war room planning.